Well, hello everyone, and welcome to our live online event. This is uh, Nelly, and um, I'm really happy to be here. This is uh, week three of our session. Let me just make some um, technical fixes here. Uh, just let me know if you can hear me by adding yes to the chat box. And feel free to add anything else. I'm really, really happy that you joined. I'm sure others will come in as well. This is a live event. Your face will not appear, so no worries. I will disable the live event as soon as my part is over, and then we'll get started with live questions. Really looking forward to that. Okay, so I'm looking for, can you hear me? So to make sure, let me know in the chat if my voice is audible. And I see that there is, great. All right, thank you so much for adding that. I don't know why I appear twice. Uh, let me see if I can get rid of one of me. Well, no, I got rid of two of me. Okay, so, uh, all right. So action research is a way for teachers, as uh, most of you know, for teachers to make a difference. And teachers make a difference on a daily basis. They're forever making a difference to their students because they're so anxious to um, make sure that everything is working and the students are getting the most, sometimes a lot more than their students are. In many cases, teachers are more motivated than students to learn. And that's unfortunate because it should be a partnership. And that's what action research does. It helps teachers learn about what they're doing and how they can change perhaps uh, things so that their students are able to engage and communicate and learn. One of the key issues with um, learning, when you do it on your own, you're kind of leading yourself. But when you're in a classroom with a teacher leading, it makes it a lot more difficult because you're not in charge as the learner, the teacher is in charge. And this is something that uh, we should perhaps consider and have the student in charge. Maybe that will resolve a lot of our issues. Many teachers have mentioned, especially during COVID for the past uh, year and a half, two years, that students are distracted. Now, it, this was true before COVID and hopefully it won't be true after. Hopefully um, we'll manage to find a way to engage learners together with us. And perhaps the idea of learning together and partnering with our students is the way to go to ensure that students are with us and not somewhere else, wherever it happens to be. All right, so let's uh, get started with this um, new way of using Zoom. A little bit about me, I've been uh, using technology with my students uh, since um, 1993. I used to use computer labs, then I went on to use uh, the classroom, face-to-face -face classroom, and the phone, mobile devices, specifically the phone. I prefer to work with the phone. It's a lot easier. Students have it. It's more accessible and so on. I, have experience teaching English, but also experience teaching other subjects. It's not really what you teach, but it's the engagement that really matters as far as I'm concerned. That's what I'm concerned about. I'm not concerned about the content. Well, I am concerned about the content, but I'm more concerned about how students are engaging with the content and allowing them a chance to partner with each other and me for learning. My goal has always been help, to help my students 
And I think that when you focus on that, you'll get the answers. Focusing on helping our learners, finding how to help each and every one of them because there isn't a one-all fit all formula for this. It's one-on-one, -on -one, which makes it very challenging when you have a class of over 500 in the lecture hall. It really does make it difficult or online when you have thousands of students, for example, at a MOOC, a massive open online environment and you need to help. So finding ways to help, it doesn't only have to be the teacher who helps, you can set up various support systems where the students help each other. So the help is not really for me, but I'm the one that um, orchestrates how every student will get help. And my system, and I'm sure others' system is not mine specifically, but the one that I use is setting up a system where students help each other. They help each other and they love it. Uh, they love helping each other and supporting one another. One of uh, my initial problem as a teacher was perfection. I felt that I had to be perfect. Everything had to be perfect. Um, I didn't know what perfect was, but generally it meant that everybody was happy and that's impossible. Reaching perfection is a myth and it only causes, well, it caused me to uh, dysfunction. I had to give it up and figure out how to put aside my need for perfection because it was only my need. My students were very happy when I made mistakes, especially when I admitted that I make mistakes, I'm not perfect. They loved it. So being vulnerable, being human, being you is very important in the online and face-to-face -face environment. Just be you and just do it. When it comes to action research, take action. Don't overthink. Don't think you have to do a perfect research. There's no such thing. Action research is about people. It's about making mistakes. Yes, it is. It's about making mistakes over and over again and trying to come up with a resolution, something better. But you need to make mistakes in order to improve. You can't improve if it's all perfect. That's impossible. So keeping that in mind, I hope will help you understand that there's no pedestal. There's no trophy at the end. This is not a competition. Who does the best job? No. It's about people making mistakes and trying to learn from them and improve the situation. So accepting the situation as it is, not blaming anyone, not blaming the students for being distracted, not blaming yourself for not being a good teacher or not knowing how to do it. Put blame aside and just focus on what you see, observe, and just do the action research. Just do it and you'll benefit. So this is week three of action research. Every action research is back to school. We start over and over and over again, and it's always different. Week three has three sections now, not only one. I've added another additional section and I've included a section from week four and week three, but if you complete this in week four, that's fine. If you work at your own pace, that's fine. Uh, the weeks are there as a kind of um, planning stage. You don't have to go by them. You can take your time. The course will remain for you to work on for as long as you wish until the next course, which is in April. <laughs> so you have enough time until April to work. And I hope you do. Sometimes we need others around us, so it's good to have others, but you'll have me and yourself and your work. All right, so in week three, you're going to focus on collecting the data. And by data, I mean, what do you see? And we'll get to 
how do you do that? And you do it naturally anyways, but we're going to go over it to ensure that you understand that you're doing it and you don't have to really uh, carry out long formal research. Action research is not that formal. And then uh, there's conduct survey. You'll be conducting a survey or maybe two surveys, very simple. Again, view this as a draft of the final work that you'll be doing. You'll be going over it, improving it, working on it until you're happy with it. And then you'll try things out. And then again, action research is cyclic, just like life things uh, improve and then they kind of unimprove and then they improve. It's up and down like waves, just like life. And then there's the chapter three, writing, which is the outcomes and evaluations. All right, so when you collect data, first of all, collecting data is really observing, looking at what's going on. It's kind of a map. You're setting up your location. The purpose, when you collect data, think of what you want the end to be. So you've got your problem statement. You know what you want to learn about. You'll collect the information that you need. First of all, you collected it in week two from the literature, from what's out there. Now you're going to collect it from within your system, your class with your students. There is a deductive and inductive way of doing things. Don't let the word scare you. Deductive means that you're working in a certain way, inductive, you're working another way with another end in mind. We'll get to that. You'll look at samples of your students' work. It could be tests, test results, specific essays that you want to go over. If you're teaching one-on-one, -on -one, this is uh, the opportunity to go over your students' work. You'll be asking your students questions, interviewing them online, on Zoom or face-to-face. -face. You could do it individual interviews or collective group interviews. You're going to choose a qualitative, which means that you're looking for open-ended questions or quantitative, or you're looking for numbers and there's only uh, specific answers. It's not open. You're asking specific questions and you're giving them specific choices to choose from. That's basically the difference. The procedure could be in person, face-to-face, -face, if you've got that opportunity. If you don't right now, you might wanna leave that part for later. Right now, it may just be online in a virtual class through Skype, um, Facebook, Messenger, any system, WhatsApp that you find useful. And of course, you'll have a chance to set up a questionnaire and always have the problem in mind, the problem. This is the layout of chapter three. You're going to write about your expected outcomes. What do you expect? How you measured and what outcomes of the measurement you got. And then you'll analyze the information that you got. So let's go through it step by step. Uh, you can use software for this. I suggest you do not, not for action research. It's not really necessary. You could do both quantitative, where you're interested in these specific numbers, qualitative, or you can do a mix, combination of both. As I said, inductive or deductive, descriptive, summarize. You're going to summarize your findings and interpret what you see. So let's get down to what deductive and inductive means. In deductive, you are testing a theory. In your literature view, you may have found some theories that are available out there. There could be learning theories or theories that were developed by someone else. And you're going to view your findings, your data, your information, and see if you see any patterns that fit this theory. 
and you're going to compare the results to the theory. In inductive, you're going to gather information, you're going to observe patterns, and you're going to develop the theory. Isn't that amazing? So inductive is a great way to come up with new things. And I think that in action research, inductive is probably the best way to go. But then it's up to you and we will be able to discuss that. There are four kinds of evaluations because uh, in chapter three, you're going to evaluate the information and see how you can work with it. Because remember, you will base your intervention or your plan of action according to the information you received by observing and samples and questionnaire, perhaps. You don't have to do all three, you can do one. And your evaluation, whatever is easy for you, whatever works for you is fine. There's formative which means that you need to look at the information before you implement it. Is it acceptable? Processed evaluations means that did whatever come up um, fit your expectations? And outcome is the target population. How does whatever outcome you came up with affect your population, your students? And of course, impact is uh, what impact will the findings have on your goal? So what you're doing with these evaluations is you're looking at the data and you're trying to see what it means. So all it is, is simply looking very carefully at what's there. And that's important because that's what we need to do. We need to look head on at what's there and not try to avoid it. Let me see if I can get rid of my... Yeah, all right, there, I did it. Okay, so I hope uh, you're seeing the slides now that I've gone through most of them. Uh, just let me know in the chat. I see others have joined. If you're able to see everything, able to see the slides. The slides, of course, the presentation appears in the description of this recording, as well as in the course. We'll be going into the course after this presentation, and then we'll take a look at what's there. Of course, uh, then I will be allowing you to speak and I will thank you very much and I will um, stop the live streaming. The live streaming is only for the presentation. I don't want to expose anyone. All right, so let's um, continue with the check progress bar. This is for you in the course. Notice the names appear on the left for me, but you'll be able to see whatever is in the center. You'll see if you've done what you need to get done. Done is the tick and needs to be done is the blue. So you'll be following that. Let me know in the chat if you were able to do that. Were you able to access the progress bar and take a look? Just say yes or no because that's a very important part of the course to be able to see where you are. Okay, great. Being behind is fine. As I said, we all work at our own pace. The point being that we work, <laughs> okay? Um, so um, just doing it and working at our own pace, but working. So it's important to do a bit all the time, whether it's online or face-to-face, -face, but just to check to make sure that you have some kind of a progress bar for yourself so you can take a look and see how you're doing and compare it to yourself and your plans. I know they say that it's a good idea to plan ahead how you're going to work, but I know that I personally, when I plan, I don't stick to it because things happen and it makes me feel kind of uh, limited when I plan my days and too much. So as uh, whatever works for you. 
Okay, so these are the references that I used. I highly recommend Scriber for APA. They have a lot of information that'll help you. It's laid out in a very simple way. It is academic, but it doesn't feel academic. It feels like anyone can do it and you can. It's completely free. There's the link there for the APA citation generator. And there's the center of, it's of not or disease control. It has the different types of evaluations with explanations, further explanations for you. And I think I've reached the end of the presentation.